with historians. Here we, the students of Institute of History at the Government College University Lahore, invite senior scholars to discuss their ideas and works. Our today's guest is Professor Sujit Siva Sandram, who is the director of Center of South Asian Studies at University of Cambridge. Before we begin our talk with our guest, I would want to thank our Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. Askar Zedi, who has provided immense support in our efforts to hold this series. Over to you, sir. I'm really pleased that we are able to host Professor Sujit Sivan Sundaram today. His talk from his book, Waves from the South, A New History of Revolution and Empire, will provide enlightenment to many of our students and staff alike. This talk is third in the discussion series initiated by our Institute of History, and we are very pleased to establish this institute, which now consists of not only Department of History, but Art History, as well as Department of Archive Studies. And we are always pleased to welcome scholars like Professor Sujit, who is a professor of world history at University of Cambridge, and who is is also the director of Center for South Asian Studies at the same university. Thank you, Dr. Professor Sujit. I'm sure our students, in particular, those students of Institute of History, will benefit a great deal from your talk. Thank you, sir. In today's discussion, we will be talking to Professor Siva Sundaram about his recent publication, Waves Across the South, A New History of Revolution and Empire. And for the ease of our audience, allow me to give a quick overview of this book. In Waves Across the South, A New History of Revolution and Empire, Professor Sujit introduces us to far-flung archives from across the world. And usually history is told from the perspective of Northern Hemisphere. And reading those accounts, it seems as if all wisdom originates from Europe and enlightens the rest of the world. Professor Siva Sindram, through this book, covers the forgotten quarters of the Indian and Pacific Ocean and challenges the dominance of the West in their written history. And many rarely discussed stories like Anglo-Burmese War and Goldingham at Madras Observatory and places like Mauritius, Cape Town and Port Louis can be found in this book. Using the term revolution in an innovative way, Professor Siva Sindram tells us accounts of how revolutions, empires and counter-revolts crashed in the Global South. And this book narrates the history of the British Empire from the perspective of the indigenous in the Indian and the Pacific Oceans. In short, Waves Across the South allows us to rethink the history of revolutions of empire from the perspective of colonized. Sir, this was the overview of the book. And uh, now we will uh, begin our question answer session. So uh, we, welcome, uh, for, we welcome you formally to our panel discussion and uh, thank you for taking out time to join us today and it's certainly an honor to have you with us. Sir, uh, please allow me to introduce my uh, team with you. Uh, we have Sara Iqbal with us. She is an uh, MPhil student at the Institute of History GCU Lahore. We have Talha with us, Talha Shafi. He is an undergraduate student of seventh semester and our third panelist uh, is Hadia Abid. She is a third semester student, undergrad student. And I am Aisha Yusuf and I am also an MPhil student. Uh, so I guess we, if, without any delay, we should begin our discussion. Sara, would you like to take the first question, please? Thank you, Aisha. Professor, I want to ask that geographically speaking, your book covers an extensive region, which you have physically traveled to as well. And then your writing is more like a narrative, which makes this work all the more fascinating. So can you please share your experience for producing such a distinctive work? Oh, okay. So um, firstly, thank you very much um, for this invitation. And um, yeah, you're right. Um, so Waves Across the South, which is the book that we're talking about now, follows two other books. And in some ways, what I'm trying to do is to really join the gaps between these various books, both the previous book, uh, Nature and the Godly Empire and Islander were targeted at the late 18th and the early 19th century, which is a period of dramatic transformation politically with the rise of um, new kinds of global imperialism. But it's also a period of revolutionary potential, as Aisha quite rightly mentioned in her summary of the book. So the clash of these two things, you know, the global imperialism of that period, as well as the revolutionary potential of this period uh, is really very interesting to me. So in the first book that I wrote, Nature and the Godly Empire, I was writing on the South Pacific islands 
and I was interested really in the formation of modern science in this late 18th century, early 19th century moment, not in Europe, but in these small island societies uh, in the South Pacific. And so I was looking at, for instance, the exchanges of data, of specimens, of knowledge between a whole series of Europeans, especially missionaries as well, uh, and islanders, indigenous peoples uh, in this world. And it, it's into that world then that people like Charles Darwin come, because of course Charles Darwin, Darwin voyages uh, through the Pacific Ocean um, prior to coming back and much later publishing his views on evolutionary theory. So really it's a moment of a contest between different kinds of knowledge um, before we see the consolidation of modern science and also a moment where a whole range of different people indigenous peoples, people who are not professional scientists, people who are voyagers. Um, um, of course, the book actually covers the period from, say, the voyages of James Cook to the voyages of Charles Darwin. So in that sort of era, so many different rival orders of knowledge were possible. That's the first book. And then the second book was the book on Sri Lanka, um, which was called Islander. And again, it's about the same era of uh, the late 18th and the early 19th century. But here, what I was trying to do was to actually think about the inland kingdom of Kandy in Sri Lanka, which was set against uh, the British Empire. The British Empire was coming in. And really the standoff uh, between the two in relation to culture, in relation to knowledge, in relation to politics, in relation to trade, and a whole series of themes like this. Um, so what unites the two books really is the same period, as I've mentioned, but also just the rival pathways and you know, possibilities um, that were open in the late 18th century, early 19th century. And also, by the way, both the books uh, prior to this one uh, were concerned with small island societies, because the idea here is that these small island societies were very critical in this era of transformation. They could be testing grounds for knowledge and science because they're rich in terms of our geography. Uh, they could be testing grounds for new political systems because you can take over an island very quickly um, or you can create a new kind of political unit or even a utopian ideal um, on an island. And so really sort of bringing these islands to the forefront. And so it's in that context then, to get back to the question, that I decided to write Waves Across the South because I thought, well, I could in fact link the, the region of the South Pacific to the North Indian Ocean and adopt the same methods of these two prior books by really sort of thinking through, well, you know, islands are significant to this era um, and this is an era of transformation and we can retell this era of transformation from this vast zone um, like this. Um, and so the narrative then comes in as a way of reaching a public audience uh, with the story through these forgotten sites and forgotten peoples, uh, really. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Okay. Uh, Professor, I'm Hadia, and I want to ask that since your work is reflective of the perspective of colonized oceanic regions of South Asia, while drawing attention particularly produced by the sources uh, that the colonizers produce, please tell us about the challenges that you had to encounter in the process. Thank you. Now, that's a, a really good question. Um, and um, yeah, so I wanted the book really to be grounded meaning that I wanted to ground it in particular places and with the stories of particular peoples and individuals, whilst also having this um, uh, geographical reach across the Indian and Pacific Oceans in order to kind of create really the sense that there are symmetries and modes of solidarity that are possible even today between these vastly spread peoples. But so in addition to having this vast span, I wanted it to be grounded is the point that I'm making. So not for it to be you know, panoptic, looking from above, or for it to be panoramic, but really to build from these small fragments of lives, of places, into something um, bigger. And really the principle here is then that people can actually feel the, the, the period. They can kind of really feel the, the place. Um, and also that each of the sites and each of the people are different. They're not exactly the same. There are overlaps between them, um, but they're not exactly the same. So in order to do that, of course, there are plenty of colonial sources. And so one has to really tease and work against um, the colonized perspective uh, in order to bring to the front a view of these places and also the perspectives of people of color 
uh, beyond uh, those uh, colonial sources, uh, right? So that was that was uh, a major challenge. But also then I had to, in a sense, juxtapose really important um, non-colonial sources uh, next to uh, the colonial sources. And I actually got out an example just because it's kind of easier kind of working with an example. I've got the book here. Um, and this is um, a source called the Ingrisi Hatana. Okay. Uh, and the Ingrisi Hatana appears in the book. It's a palm leaf poem written in honor of the victory of the Kandian king. So we just were talking a minute ago about this kingdom in the middle of Sri Lanka, the Kandian kingdom, and actually goes to war with the British in 1803. And the Kandian king and his troops win. And it's, you know, a lot of British lives are lost. There's a lot of blood. And so this poem is actually written in honor of that victory. Um, and it's written from about 1805. And it's like a ballad written for the king, uh, which is then transcribed um, uh, on palm leaf. Um, and it's a very different account, really, of battle. So just to read one verse, it's a long poem. The idiotic British, having seen Sinhalese forces thus retreating, entered the city of Kandy like a herd of cattle that rush into a deserted field from which the farmers had taken away all the grain. The way they took up residence, this is the British taking up residence in the city, having crossed the river, shows that they are doomed to be food, the British, for crows, dogs, and foxes. So it's sources like that, really, that I wanted to kind of make space for. Now, more generally in my work, what I've tried to do is to cross-contextualize, in a sense to actually kind of work with colonial documents, but also to destabilize the colonial documents with these kinds of sources, because I don't believe that these sources are free of prejudice either, because these sorts of war poems are very ethnic poems in honor of Sinhaleseness, right? So there's a sort of ethnic ideology working in those sources. So, so what we need to do is to actually bring different types of sources together to cross contextualize them and to read, you know, cross rival kind of ideologies uh, accordingly. And so that's the method, and it's a challenging method because, of course, there are plentiful colonial sources and um, not as many um, non-colonial sources uh, to utilize. But from that sort of project, just to kind of use the example of the Ingrisi Hafna, one goes to the age of revolution because this is an account of total war. So if one is thinking about the age of revolutions as a moment where one gets ruthless looting and um, you know, huge bloodshed and, and, and warfare of a global scale, then actually this Kandian war uh, is in keeping with that. And one can actually make that argument from a source like the Ingrisi Hatana, but also from, of course, the many military records of those wars uh, kept by um, colonial officers and fighters and so forth. So that was kind of really impressive to see them at least from the lens of colonial, 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 right? I'm right. um, sorry, what was that again? Sorry, from the lens, I heard from the lens. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, I was talking that it was kind of very helpful to see the book from the lens of colonized as well as the colonizers, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that's really the method to actually kind of bring sources together from these various perspectives. Um, and whilst doing that, not to allow um, the colonized person to dominate the history. Yes, sir. Or Thank you so much. Purified indigenous perspective either. Professor Han Pelha, my question to you is your accounts are enriched by the deep archival research and illustrations of paintings and drawings. Uh, Professor, my question is to what extent can these sources, particularly the visuals, help historians to strengthen their research? Yeah, enormously, really, um, because the images are not illustrative in the book, meaning that they're not just there to, to make the book pretty. Um, they're really part of the argument of uh, the book. Um, and as I was just mentioning earlier, um, you know, there's a challenge because there are a lot of colonial textual sources. And so in addition to destabilizing that through the addition of these alternative sources, it's also possible to work across material culture, to work across visual sources uh, in order to get more perspectives in. And so what I thought I'd do is I'd actually show you here uh, the screen, if I'm able to do this. Um, let me see, share screen. Um, and hopefully you can now see um, this, uh, this set of images. Um, and these are from around 1830, and they're of Parsi shipbuilders, and they appear in the book. 
Now, these are very rich images of elite men who benefited from Indian Ocean trade and shipping, and they're images that actually have been used by others. Uh, they fit into a tradition of European portraiture, arguably, because it's this classic sort of way of thinking about images where you have this man sitting in the front and there's a window out of which, you know, you can see the broader world. And this is a sort of classic trope uh, of European portraiture. And of course, these men are appearing with tools of their trade. There's a divider in the hand of one. Uh, there's a ruler, uh, which is inscribed, I think, um, formerly as a, as a present. Uh, to him uh, from the East India Company. There's a ship in the background in one of the images. And so you kind of get to the idea of their vacation and their, um, uh, and uh, really uh, it again fits in with European portraiture. But if you look carefully, this uh, I interpreted this as that, um, you know, this is also an indicator of all the labor that they undertook, um, not simply their genius, because normally with European portraits like this, they're indicators of genius. Of manly genius and there's something of that here but it's also really all the hard work um there's another portrait i think where one of them even has his eyes closed uh one of his eyes closed so really um the hard work that goes in um to this um sort of shipbuilding undertaken um by these parsi shipbuilders and also the fact that they were aggrieved at their conditions that european shipbuilders had m many more possibilities uh in bombay uh, than they did um, and then in turn, what I do in the book is I kind of use that as a gateway into thinking about how they set up self-assemblies for self-governance, right, which is uh, a classic marker of the age of revolutions, and also how they had not only a connection with Britain, but also a connection with Oman. Um, so they were not simply looking uh, to the British. So it's possible to actually kind of go from classic images like this into kind of a whole series of other pathways rather than simply down uh, the established one, which is that it is uh, a, a European styled uh, image. So that just is one example, but that's what I try to do elsewhere in the book as well, um, to give a sense of um, the particular individuals, but to actually kind of open up different kinds of questions um, about their biographies to the ones that um, we might normally get to by looking at the textual archive. Professor, my next question is, in the broader maritime world, your work contends that on the Tasman Sea, the relationship between fishing and the constructions of gender was different from what the European explorers brought, that is heavily masculine. So should we think that this difference in gender order was specific to the islands of Tasman Sea only, or a similar pattern could be seen among the other colonized regions of Asia and Africa also? Thank you. Now, that's a really important question, and I was very keen to bring in gender into this argument about the age of revolutions, right? So, um, just to, to take a step back, the argument is that this concept of the age of revolutions means a whole series of other things in the Indian Ocean, Pacific Ocean, um, connected to indigenous presence, uh, really, and the counter-revolution of uh, the British Empire, and that it has, in relation to gen gender, intimate consequences. Um, for the organization of identity and life. So, um, yes, um, gender order is changing more broadly across the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, for sure. But it's not changing exactly in the same way as it is off the coast of Tasmania. And this is in keeping with really the point that I made earlier, that each of these places and people is different, right? So it's not that the Tasman world is exactly the same as the Bay of Bengal, is exactly the same as the Persian Gulf, etc., etc. What I was trying to do in the book is to actually keep alive a sense of the specificity of the age of revolutions in each of these contexts, whilst also generate a gesturing towards the symmetry uh, in other places. So to kind of sketch out how this works in the Tasman Sea, um, um, the argument is that, um, and this draws on a wealth of scholarship coming out of this region, that Aboriginal Tasmanian women, for instance, played an active role in the seal trade. Um, and um, they even swam with dead seals, and that European men and um, Western men of various kinds actually relied on them. And similarly, on the coast of Sydney, um, that the way fishing was organized was very different, um, where uh, Aboriginal women, for instance, could fish in canoes. Um, and so there already, there's a difference between what's going on in Tasmania and what's going on off the coast of Sydney. 
um, it was useful, suggested to kind of juxtapose those two things, but there are actually slight differences in the story. And so we need to be aware of those differences. But certainly what's going on is that by the 1840s and so on, this idea of the Judeo-Christian marriage is coming in um, together with the British Empire and reorganizing these extant gender orders. And so we can see that happening certainly uh, in South Asia as well. I just I just want to ask that uh, uh, the Aboriginal women can do fishing, but and European women were not allowed to or they did not uh, do fishing. So the question here is in their literature, they totally changed. Uh, they totally changed the uh, gender roles and assigned different roles to each other. Yeah, absolutely. They did. I mean, that's what yeah. happens really with yeah. this notion of um, uh, the, the Christian marriage, which comes in. Um, into this Tasman world. And so yeah. the roles of um, the Aboriginal women and the Maori women in, ma in mixed marriages, for instance, I mean, ma in the Maori case especially, uh, are as, as helpmates uh, to the men. And so there's a sort of change. Um, I mean, it's not total because there are always people um, who resist and who kind of follow different pathways. But the transition of gender roles, uh, I argue, is really in keeping with um, the counter revolution of the British Empire. Professor Mark Harrison in his article Science and the British Empire views the colonial science in relation with the indigenous scientific traditions and the use of network-based models to understand scientific relations within and beyond the colonial context. Similarly, your work asserts that the locals contributed hugely in the generation of knowledge. So can we relate the two works? And through the lens of the colonized, how much of a role did the empire play in discrediting the locals for contributing their skills and knowledge on which the colonizers base their and then restructure the knowledge of these regions. Yeah, so I can't exactly remember what the two-way process was, whether it is that there's a two-way process of a relationship between science and empire or whether it's a two-way process in relation to um, the colonial metropole and the so-called periphery. Um, but more broadly, um, um, do you want to spell out? Uh, uh, more broadly, what, what I'm kind of um, arguing for is that, yes, science is at the heart of empire. And that there isn't necessarily a causal relationship. So it's not that empire generates new science or that science justifies empire. They're far more kind of entangled. Um, it's almost like, you know, the two things are one and the same rather than there being um, uh, a two-way relationship between science and empire, right? So, so it's, I mean, just to sort of make the point, I mean, for instance, in the book, I talk about raffles in Singapore uh, in 1819, and at the same time as he's there, there's surveying going on in Singapore Harbour um, by Daniel Ross. So, you know, it's not that one follows the other or one is before the other. It's actually totally simultaneous and totally of, you know, together. Yeah. Um, and that's really um, uh, the arguments that are mounting in the book. But more broadly, I guess what I'm saying is that um, this placement of science has consequences for selfhood. It has consequences for imperial reach. It has consequences even for the way the global is understood and the globe is understood uh, in this era. So um, I think you mentioned, actually, Asha, at the start, uh, the story of the Madras Observatory and Goldingham. Um, and so if you look at Madras Observatory, there's a sort of it's hugely multidisciplinary. There's a whole series of different mapping enterprises uh, going on, and it's about different elements, um, you know, the sea, the air, the temperature, the stars. Um, and so it's spilling over by way of geography. It's, you know, launching enterprises off to Southeast Asia. It's spilling over by way of discipline. Um, and then it's in keeping really with the character of empire as well, as it too spills over um, from Madras, Various of these theorists, theorists who are scientists will make cases for other bases, um, even as they plot uh, the monsoon. Um, and so, yeah, um, science is at the heart of empire. Um, and because it's at the heart of empire like this, there is a theft, certainly, of um, skills and knowledge um, from indigenous peoples, which I think is the second part of uh, the question. And um, but the point that I make in the book is that though intermediaries certainly play a role in providing knowledge, they're very quickly uh, erased uh, through this program of multidisciplinary mapping.
uh, that unfold uh, and data gathering uh, that unfold uh, in this era. Sir, uh, I want to ask that what exactly Empire, uh, uh, what role did ex Empire play in discrediting uh, the services of uh, the colonized people and how they restructure the knowledge of, of these regions later on? Yeah, so that's what I was um, getting. Thanks, Asha. That was what I was trying to get to as well, get at as well with the intermediary. So there's an erasure um, and a bypassing of the intermediaries. And the way I explain it is because it's very multidisciplinary modeling that's afoot, um, it becomes hugely statistical and the person and the personal relations actually disappear even as the globe itself uh, is modeled uh, like this. So knowledge is restructured because um, personal knowledge, intimate knowledge um, has to sort of become part and parcel of the statistical world, um, a world which is detached um, or a kind of scientific understanding which is detached um, from place and from people. Um, and so that's one way to kind of explain the discrediting uh, of ex extant worldviews. Professor, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. <laughs> Thanks for testing. Professor, your work has broadened the traditional meaning attached to the indigenous agency. As you state that people were only moved among those regions for better opportunities. Uh, Professor, how did colonization and globalization uh, alter or let us, let's say, expand the meaning attached to the indigenous? Thank you. Well, that's a really good question as well. Um, so yes, the book uses indigenous in order to bring together vastly different kind of um, histories of people of color and colonized people. Um, and it does so in an unorthodox fashion. Because for instance, we're, we're putting Aboriginal history next to Maori history, next to uh, the history of Mauritian people, next to the history of Sri Lankans, Burmese and so on. So it's a very expansive concept of indigenous. And I realize that it may not be acceptable to everyone. Um, in my other work, what I've tried to do is to historicize the concept of indigenous. So, in, for instance, in relation to Sri Lanka and in Islanders, one of the arguments is that the British are defining the indigenous, and they're defining it very narrowly in relation to this person belongs here and has been resident here, right? So the Sinhalese are the true indigenous peoples of Sri Lanka, according to the British, and the Tamils are recent migrants. And so even the last kings of Kandy and their relatives and so on actually, according to the British, truly belong in East India Company territory in the mainland, not in Sri Lanka. So it's a narrow conception of um, the indigenous and it's a politically and ideologically colonial conception of the indigenous. So my kind of answer to your question is one has to first historicize the notion of the indigenous and understand its colonial origin and even the idea of the native is you know, close to this as a colonial categorization. Once one does that, one can actually critically reclaim it and recast it. And that's what Waves Across the South is trying to do. And so then you can actually, one has to sort of reinterpret it in a way that's politically meaningful and historiographically meaningful for the subject that you're undertaking. And so hence, I use a very wide conception of indigenous and I work against all the colonial racial classifications, which structured the story so that Aboriginal history actually doesn't belong together with South Asian history, doesn't belong together with African history. So, you know, we dismiss all of that and create a space of belonging uh, around it. Um, so, yeah, so that's how that's the sort of methodology and that's how Indigenous is being utilized here. Okay, uh, Professor, I want to ask that uh, Mauritius continued to be a colony under varying competitive European powers. Similarly, Cape Town also experienced an extended colonial role despite several changes in the ruling power. A swing in the cultures of all such colonies is visible. Looking at it from the lens of diversity, does this past contribute towards the emergence of rainbow culture or has it had a negative impact on the native or indigenous cultures? Also, uh, what is the perspective of colonized here? Yeah, so diversity is something of a buzzword, isn't it, in our world now, and we actually kind of value diversity quite rightly, um, and uh, we should see it, and so rainbow culture um, here is, is a really good thing, and, and rightly so. However, a bit like the indigenous, 
um, concept, we need to understand that diversity also has a kind of colonial kind of heritage to it of some kind, right? So in cities like Port Louis or in Cape Town or even in Colombo, which feature at the end of the book, um, the urban histories of these um, sites which suddenly kind of expand demographically uh, in the middle of the 19th century is, is one of the places where the book ends. And they expand partly um, after the emancipation um, of enslaved peoples. Um, and so visitors will come and actually comment on, you know, the racial diversity, shall we say, the racial range of these people. And it's a kind of very racial vocabulary of, of difference, of the fact that there are so many different kinds of people in these sites uh, and these port cities in the Indian Ocean world. And then the issue is, how do you come to terms with difference? You need to classify into different categories. And you need to sort of have different quarters in the cities for different groups of people. And this becomes especially important then in the Indian Ocean context when there is, yes, a disease event like, a, you know, so we say a pandemic or an epidemic or when there's a fire or something like this, which is what um, I look at at the end of the book. So we have very diverse cities emerging in the middle of the 19th century, but they're colonially diverse and they're segregated and they're so bit managed and surveilled like this. Um, so. In that aftermath, yes, we can use the word diversity, but we need to understand how it actually functions uh, in, uh, or how the kind of sense of the diverse functions uh, in this era. And we, in a sense, need to decolonize this concept, um, right? Um, and certainly, uh, the impact on indigenous peoples is huge in relation to this migration um, of, um, I mean, in Mauritius, of course, there are strictly no indigenous peoples. Everyone comes. Um, uh, and then various people claim indigenous status, but because of the colonial management of these differences, some populations ascend up the social scale, others get, you know, um, marginalized um, and so forth in relation to, to ownership of land. So uh, we've got to be really careful, I guess, in simply celebrating diversity. Um, we've got to understand really some of its colonial foundations, and certainly we can celebrate if we've understood that. Um, and we also need to think about actually how certain populations continue to be present and not other populations and how the pathways taken by different groups are unequal and divergent um, as well. Uh, when we read your book, we clearly identify the role that Indo-Pacific region, especially Mauritius and Muscat, has played in the global politics, particularly during the colonial era. However, it doesn't seem to receive recognition in the historical account that it deserves, despite being this rich in history and archive. Why? Yeah, so that kind of takes us really to the start of our conversation in some ways, because I think islands and small sites are often marginalized in big histories and, and national histories and so forth as well, because um, I guess historiography has been tied up with area studies, um, these sites don't often figure in area studies formulations because they're at the margins of area studies, right? Sri Lanka is at the margin of India, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so they don't really fit very neatly into the way historical knowledge has been um, has proceeded. At the same time, people are not curious about these sites. So, for instance, I mean, the story that comes to mind immediately um, since you mentioned Mauritius is Tipu Sultan of Mysore, right? So he has contact with Mauritius, but people who write on Mysore don't actually follow the archives in Mauritius. They don't go to Mauritius or whatever. And so, unfortunately, that end of the story has been lost, um, right? Or, you know, is known by Mauritian historians and, and maybe they don't know enough about it. So, in a sense, really, the national um, separations of these historical narratives in turn has meant that the, the links across the Indian Ocean are lost as well. So in addition to it actually being that these sites are not central to the conception of history via area studies, um, and also because we, we like big places, uh, it's also that the specialisms have actually meant that the links between them um, too have been lost. So there are two reasons, I guess, or even three reasons um, why um, it is the case um, that um, they have not received recognition to use the phrasing of your question. Uh, Professor, the last question that I want to ask before we seek permission, and this one is more out of curiosity than anything else. 
uh, being the professor of world history, uh, you have talked about many undiscovered areas. Can you please mention some other forgotten areas on which this research of yours can be extended? Absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, to be very clear, it's not comprehensive, right? It wasn't intended to be comprehensive because, as I said earlier, I wanted to focus on particular, really bring to life particular places and particular people. So it, to do that, it couldn't be the history of the whole of the Indian Ocean and the whole of the Pacific Ocean. So, for instance, the Pacific, we could go north, we could go to Hawaii, we could go to Japan. Um, and in the Indian Ocean, we could go up the coast of East Africa, uh, to East Africa, for instance, um, more. Um, I mean, of course, as somebody mentioned, Oman and uh, features uh, in the book and the Persian Gulf features in the book. But really, uh, more work could be done on the East African coast, for instance. Certainly, we could do more with um, what is today Pakistan, right? Um, so, uh, I mean, it features in passing in that uh, section on the Persian Gulf. But really, you know, it could be brought in uh, more significantly, that line of coast. Uh, into the argument. So there are a whole series of regions which um, were not covered, um, where more work could be done on uh, the age of revolutions and what this transformative era uh, looks like. Um, certainly, it would be possible also to take this argument forward in time. So one could ask, you know, what is the story after the end of uh, the age of revolution as we get go into uh, the age of anti-colonialism in the middle of the 19th century or um, you know, or uh, the kind of height of empire at the end of the 19th century. Is there a kind of maritime story uh, that could be told um, for that era as well, for some of these sites? So that could actually also be something to consider. Um, and of course, since we're having this interview um, straight after the announcement of this pact between the UK, Australia and America, and really the tussle for the Indo-Pacific, you know, really coming to the forefront once again of the news, we know that this conception of the Indo-Pacific is still with us in strategic terms and probably will be with us now for a long time. And so to really think through its various kind of moments uh, up to the present moment uh, would be really good. And once again, you know, islands in the Pacific are becoming sites of contestation between um, various outside powers. Um, and similarly, you know, in Sri Lanka, the Chinese are, are building, like in other parts of, uh, that we know, uh, in the sea. So, um, yeah, um, so I think the story carries on to the present and more research could be done on the more contemporary dimension of this story as well. Thank you so much, Professor, for your generous response. With this, I thank you, Professor, on behalf of the Institute of History for your time and interest in our activity. It was an absolutely great experience to have you as our guest today, and we certainly look forward to have you again very soon with another book of yours. And I thank my audience as well for their time. Thank you so much and goodbye.